Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well. Today the subject of my lecture is British fiction from James to Rashidi. In the previous lecture, we discussed the traditions in 20th century English poetry. And in today's lecture, we will move our attention towards British fiction. First of all, let's look uh, at the outline of the lecture, today's lecture. These are the outlines of today's lecture, right? The field of English fiction has grown remarkably in the 20th and the 21st century. So yes, in the 20th and the 21st century, there was a huge amount of English fiction, right? A vast amount of English fiction was produced. The house of fiction, as Henry James said, now in, encompasses any number of genres, including the subject of this lecture, what we might call the literary or quality novel. Yes, the house of fiction, which that Henry James said, this house of fictions was, it, it incorporates or it encompasses any number of genres. There were number of genres which can be fit, which can be put under the umbrella of this house of fiction, right? So there were uh, so many genres, genres of romance, or you can say genres of, uh, uh, love, uh, you can say um, genres of uh, hate, war, etc. All those genres, all those fields, all those uh, scopes were fit under uh, the house of fiction. They were covered under the house of fiction. Henry James, who was born in 1843 and died in 1916, he was an American and he uh, had a great influence or a significant influence on the literature of his uh, adoptive country, that is England. Jamesian theory encompassed three primary components. So he believed in three canons, right? His theory believes in three primary components. First of all, he believed that uh, he believed that novel was less worth the. He believed that novel was less worth the novelist depicted than how he or she depicted. So he believed more in. Uh, in the way or the manner uh, of, um, in, in the manner how the novelist uh, depicts the novel, right? Uh, he was more interested or he believed more in that thing. He believed in the manner of depiction rather in mere depiction, right? The second thing is, the second canon he, he believed in was, he instructed novelists to show, not tell, with this famous injunction, dramatize it, dramatize it, right? So he wanted novelists to show, not only tell, right? Uh, he wanted novelists to dramatize, right? To dramatize the thing, to show the thing, to act the things. And with this famous quotation like, dramatize it, dramatize it. The third point is, he took from the great French master the sense that form, special elegance was important. Yes, he, he imbibed this thing from his, from his great French masters. He, he, he imbibed that thing that, he imbibed the sense that uh, the form, that the special elegance was more important regarding to him. And he wrenched English fiction away from what he called the great baggy monsters produced in the infancy of the genre. So he wrenched English fiction away from those which he called the great baggy monsters, right? So he wanted to take English fiction away from those great baggy monsters, from the old monsters which he called. Of course, baggy monsters continue to be produced by such writers as Arnold Bennett, John Goldsworthy and even H. G. Wells. But James challenged British novelists to write more artistically and to set their aim higher than it had been earlier. Right. So James, in a way, challenged the English novelists. He wanted English novelists to to write more artistically, to more beautifully. Right. Uh, then they then then uh, and and they and he also wanted the English novel novelists to set their aims higher than they were than they than they had been earlier. What James meant by the first element of his theory, how not what a novel depicts, is 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 demonstrated in his famous ghost story, The Turn of the Screw. So through his first element of his theory, we come to know that he was interested in how, not what a novel 
depicts, right? He was interested in how a novelist or a novel depicts something. And this is demonstrated in his first famous ghost story that is entitled as The Turn of the Screw. In this story, the, it, you can say that the story is narrated autobiographically by a governess who has been hired to look after two children in a country house. So you see in this story, a governess uh, has been hired to look after two children in a country house and the house uh, may or may not be haunted. And a corrupt former employee in the house, Quint, Peter Quint, seems to be spectrally present. Spectrally present mean uh, uh, ghostly present or are the presence of the figment. It is only the figment of imagination or the presence of a ghost, right? A ghost of the quench is present. It, it, it spectrally present mean that thing. And a crack farmer imply Quint, uh, who is spectrally present, and uh, he may somehow have possessed the children. So that the spectral uh, spectral presence of the uh, former corrupt imply Quint may somehow have possessed the children, with two children who are there in the house in the country house. The reader is never quite convinced, however, of the version of events given by the governess. Of course, the readers who read the novel or the ideas of the novel, they are not convinced. They are not very convinced uh, how, uh, from the version of the events given by the governess in the, in, in, in the novel. James' narrative concludes with the governess determined to exorcise Miles, one of her charges, from the evil spirit of Quint. She holds him in her, in her arms, shaking him, shaking him violently. So James' narrative or James' story concludes with the governess who is there, uh, in, in, who is there in the house. And she, what does she do? She exercises miles. Exercise does mean when you drive out an evil spirit from a person, place, or thing, especially by an incantation or prayer, right? You or you can say that exercise means to rid a person, place, or thing of an evil spirit. So governess is there, and she wants uh, the she wants Mills to get rid of the evil spirit, right? And what does she do? <clears throat> she holds him in her arms and she shakes him violently. Just before Miles dies of shock in her arms, he asks he asks. If the presence of Quint is in the room and speak his speak the words "you devil," so just before dying, Miles asks if the presence uh, Miles asks about Miles interrogates about the presence of Quint in the room and speaks the words "you devil." Is he talking to Quint, whom the governess never sees, or to the governess herself, so who has tormented Miles until his heart stops from sheer terror? So. This thing is beautifully created by the James in the story that uh, this is ambiguity in the novel in the concluding part of the novel. Uh, we don't know or the or, or Quint don't know what the or the governess don't know uh, or she doesn't know that uh, Quint is talking um, uh, uh, that he that the person in the who is spectrally present in the room uh, that is Quint. We don't know whether Miles is talking to Quint, who is actually present in the room, or to the governess herself, right, who tormented him uh, until his heart stops from the sheer terror. So James creates an exquisite and delicate ambiguity that is as horrifyingly thrilling as any slasher movie. So James deliberately and exquisitely and delicately creates such ambiguity at the end, right? With this ambiguity is horrifyingly thrilling as any horror movie. Let me share the few lines from the uh, from this novel, right? I will just narrate the few lines for you guys here. Here we have the few lines from, from the novel, from the work, The Turn of the Screw. He gave a frantic little shake for air and light. He was at me in a white rage, bewildered, glaring vainly over the place and missing wholly. Though it now, to my sense, filled the room like the taste of poison, the white, overwhelming presence. It is he. I was so determined to have all my proof that I flashed into eyes to challenge him. Whom do you mean by he? 
Peter Quint, you devil. These were the lines from the work. And the third point is, the line of James is a distinguished thread that runs through the whole course of fiction written after him. So his line is a kind of distinguished thread, right? He paved the way. He paved the way for others, uh, for other fiction writers as well. And the whole course of fiction uh, written uh, after him actually follows this, follows his line as well. And it, you can say that that distinguished thread runs through the whole course of fiction that was produced after him. James himself was both a master of narrative and the most influential critic of his time. A principal disciple and, a, and, and friend of James was Joseph Conrad, whom, yes, we, whom the, we also looked at in the previous lecture. We didn't discuss him in detail. Uh, Conrad is formally in what the British critic F.R. Lewis called the great tradition of the English novel. Yes, he was the great tradition of the English novel, by which Lewis me meant the moral tradition. Uh, you can say that he was the great moral tradition in the English novel or of the English novel. As Lewis mapped it, this tradition began with Jane Austen and moved through George Eliot, Henry James and Joseph Conrad, terminating with D.H. Lawrence. So according to, but, uh, according to the map of the Lewis, uh, regarding to Lewis map, this moral, this great moral tradition started with Jane Austen and it also moved through George, George Eliot and it also incorporates Henry James and also covers John Joseph Conrad and it terminates at D.H. Lawrence. D.H. Lawrence period starts from 1885 and ends at 1930. It's a quite a, it's a comparatively short period than the other writers of the time. Lawrence summed up the essence of the great tradition when he called the novel the only bright look of life. So he summed up, Lawrence summed up the tradition because as the moral, uh, great moral tradition ends or terminates at D, with, with D.S. Lawrence, so he summed up the essence of this great tradition. When he called the novel the one bright book of life, so according to Lawrence, this novel is one bright book of life. It's a Bible after, for an age that, thanks to Darwin, had outgrown or grown beyond its predecessor, uh, predecessor, the original Bible. So this novel actually uh, outgrown or grown beyond uh, the original Bible, right? Thanks to Darwin as well. Undeniably for the novelists in the great tradition, the novel is an instrument for the analysis of moral complexity. Yes, novel is an instrument for the analysis of moral complexity. So it's a beautiful instrument for the analysis for, analysis for the examin, examination of moral complexity. The novel is situ situational. It does not work with simple abstract moral axioms such as thou shall not kill. Right? Novel, in, in D.H. Lawrence's case, is situational. It does not work with simple abstract moral axioms such as thou shall not kill. So in D.H. Lawrence's case, novel, is not, novel does not limit itself to moral axioms like thou, you shall not kill or thou shall not kill, kill, right? For example, in Lawrence's novel, Sons and Lovers, for example, the situation makes it right for the hero, Paul Morrill, to kill his terminally uh, ill mother. You can see that in normally moral, um, normal morality, or you can say in normal moral axioms, you do not kill, right? You shall not kill. But in D.S. Lawrence's case, or in his novel, Sons and Lover, so the situation, the situation is such that it makes for the hero, Paul Hero, uh, Paul Morrill, to kill, to kill whom? To kill his terminally ill, ill mother. What do you mean by terminally ill? Terminally, terminally ill mean having an incurable condition that will lead to death. So in his case, in, in, in Sons and Lovers, so Paul does even a, a kind of sacred action by killing his mother, right? So that's why we say that novel is situation, situational in D.H. Lawrence's case. Specifically, we have first example from Sons and Lovers. Another basic axiom is thou shall not commit adultery. Yes, we have another basic moral axiom 
that is thou shall not commit adultery but again in lawrence's lady chatterley's low lover it is absolutely right and moral for mellers and connie to commit adultery yes again it this adultery in the case of lady chatterley's lover it is even a sacred act to have to commit adultery right so this adultery becomes okay or even sacred in case of uh, uh, Mallers and Connie in Lady Chatterley's Lover. So, so we can say that the novel is situational in, in D.H. Lawrence's case. Thus, the novel is a wonderful diagnostic tool for depicting the infinite moral complexity of life. So novel is also considered as a wonderful diagnostic tool, right, for depicting the infinite morality, the infinite moral complexity of life. The novel too is particularly delicate. Only the novel Lawrence argued can catch the shimmering rainbow of human relationship, the extra, the extra, the extraordinary mortality and volatility of, for example, love. So yes, novel is also a It is particularly delicate, but it, it also has the ability to catch the shimmering rainbow of of human relationships, the complex rainbow of human relationships, the extraordinary mortality or you can say the motion and the vol volatility of love as well. This is a major enterprise in D.H. Lawrence's two great, greatest works, The Rainbow and its sequel, Women in Love. So this can also be found in D.H. Lawrence's two greatest works, that is The Rainbow and its sequel, Women in Love as well. The motto that sums up Conrad's projection of fiction comes from his novel, Lord Jim in the destructive element immerse. Yes, the motto, this motto, uh, that can be summed up, summed up or it, uh, it sums up Conrad's projection of fiction in his work, in his novel, Lord Jim, in the destructive element immerse. Let's see what happens in Lord Jim or how it sums up in Conrad's, Conrad's fiction, projection of fiction. In Lord Jim, the hero is an officer on board, a passenger vessel in, in the Indian Ocean. Yes, the hero in the novel, Lord Jim, is an officer on board, an on passenger board vessel, vessel, which is there in the Indian Ocean. The ship is about to sink, and most of its passengers, who are religious pilgrims, are doomed. So this is a kind of titanic situation, right? So the ship is about to sink, and the most of the passengers over there on, on board are religious pilgrims, right? Jim, whereas the hero, Jim, is an officer there on the ship. Jim finds himself on deck with a lifeboat below him. Yes, he finds a life lifeboat below him. So if he jumps, he will live, he will survive. But it is his duty as an officer on the board to save others, to save the lives of the other passengers as well. And it is his duty to save the lives of the passenger first, then save his life as well. But for reason, for, for even he does not understand, he jumps to the lifeboat. So instead of saving other lives, uh, he jumps onto the lifeboat. So miraculously, uh, as you can say, unbelievably, the ship does not sink and all the other people also survive. So what happens after that? Jim is disgraced and stripped of his office. He spends the remainder of his life atoning for, the one, for that one leap. So yes, Jim has, to, uh, Jim has to live a disgraceful life and he was stripped of his office. He, his his, his, his uh, designation was also taken away, right? And he spends the rest of his life in for atoning for, for that one jump. He has always been a good man and is not by nature a coward. But until his plunge into the destructive element, the test or ordeal, he does not realize how hard it is to do the right thing. So he was a good man. He was not a coward. But until his last pl his, his plunge, his jump, into the destructive element, the test or ordeal. So until that lost jump, he, he does not realize that how hard it is to do the right thing. So the, uh, this, this can be related to uh, Conrad's projection of fiction as well. Conrad's most enduring work over the last 100 years, as we saw earlier, is Heart of Darkness, a story told with Jamesian subtlety. His, his very famous work is Heart of Darkness, which, uh, which is a kind of a story told with Jamesian subtlety. 
the story narrates the passage of marlow a river through the congo to make yes you will uh, study this novel in maybe in the seventh semester as well in seventh semester, semester of bs this story narrates the passage of marlow a river through the congo to make contact with course and imply of a company engaged in looting the congo of natural resources yes this is a story where uh, marlow travels in the story uh, marlow travels to congo and they they travel there and they are looting the natural resources uh, of congo or you can say the native resources which are there and the colonials are looting all those natural resources and kurtz is also a character and he is he is an employee and he although he belongs to the native country for congo but he was an employee of the colonials uh, of the colonizers so marlow at marlow tracks um, uh, tracks goes down and looks into the blackness of the at the center of the african continent and just marlow with the help of course tracks on all those area and he sees in the blackness of the center at the center of the african continent and thereby he also sees the darkness of the human conditions course it transpires holy mad course looks like a holy mad right but he is living in the in the lunatic asylum of european colonialism and perhaps the only response possible in that colonialism in that asylum is also to be mad because looks like a holy mad person but of course he is living in the asylum of european colonialism so the only response possible for him is that the asylum uh, for so the only response possible in that asylum is to be mad of course marlow ends his story with the affirmation that kurz was a remarkable man yes marlow ends his story with 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 with, with the admiration of kurz and the words spoken by the by by kurz the horror the horror at the end of the story at the end of the death at the end of the kurz death have for marlow candor conviction and the ring of truth so according to marlow the words spoken at the death of the uh, before the death of kurz with the words he spoke the horror the horror so these words according to marlow have candor they have conviction they have the ring of truth out of darkness says something that can be said in a novel a historian look a historian looking at european colonialism will arrive at historian judgments yes this these words can be said in a novel for example if a historian is looking at european colonialism he will arrive at histo hist historical judgments right and if, if a moralist is looking at a colonialism he will arrive at moral judgments but a novelist looking at the same subject arrives at complexity rather than hard and fast conclusions right so in the case of novelist he novelist he or she will, will arrive at complexity rather than hard and fast conclusions <clears throat> heart of darkness is central to the evolution of what is called post colonial fiction so heart of darkness a novel produced by joseph conrad so it is considered as a central to the evolution of post colonial fiction right as mentioned in the earlier lecture the novel has also been attacked by chinua achebe as a racist text so chinua achebe also attacks this novel as a racist text achebe himself is a nobel prize winner and and the author of the of an extraordinary writer rewriter of the hardies the mayor of the coast bridge so which be considered as he is also a nobel prize winner right and he is you know, extra he, he is an author of the rewriter hardies the mayor of coast bridge the it is hardies original work and he read or this word and the chebis novel is called things fall apart this is a quotation for wb yates and this is also a novel produced by chebis right so it it is it looks like an interesting thing that uh that j s hardy and and to a degree conrad they have come together in hab right survey courses tend to slice literature up into single text but in fact literature is always in conversation with itself yes survey courses they will slice literature into different single text but up, but overall literature is always in conversation with itself so this is the end of today's lecture and tomorrow we will discuss this modernism and post modernism modernism and the other writers of the um 20th and 21st century, century english fiction thank you very much for watching if you have any question please do ask